Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We'll be talking about ethical reasoning for computer scientists. In this follow-on to HILT's 2021 conference, we will learn how embedded ethics seeks to make ethical reasoning integral to computer science education. We'll explore how embedding philosophers directly into computer science courses helps students student learn how to think through the ethical and social implications of their work. And we'll take a deeper dive into the nuts and bolts of the collaborative teaching lab. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. James, the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you very much for the handoff. Let me now try uh, to share my screen. I'm so glad to be here uh, to kick us off with an overview of uh, the Embedded Ethics Program at Harvard. And so at a high level, uh, why is this program important? Well, we think that it's because, you know, if we look at technology, in a certain sense, we're in the best of times and we're in the worst of times. So there have been a bunch of uh, things that have happened even very recently in human history that have showed how technology can really improve uh, people's lives. So, you know, the fact that we're here uh, sort of collaborating remotely uh, across the internet, hearing each other's audio and video, that's amazing, right? The fact that we can basically type any question into an answer box and get something back from the void, that's also pretty crazy. The fact that we carry these tiny supercomputers in our pocket that can uh, take videos and uh, allow us to make phone calls and uh, browse the web, that's amazing. So, you know, I don't want to come out here and say, well, it's all just doom and gloom. Technology is just ruining us. But on the other hand, technology may be slightly ruining us. Uh, so there have been a lot of uh, high profile problems with technology uh, that we've all probably heard about in recent years. So, for example, security is a big issue. Um, you know, when you look at these tiny supercomputers that we carry around, um, a lot of the apps that we use on uh, those phones, they have security problems, not just on Android, but on iPhone as well. You may have heard of a lot of problems with the way that machine learning has been applied to um, various societal uh, situations. So, for example, there's this great article from ProPublica, which talks about how machine learning uh, has been used to decide how to uh, sentence people in judicial situations, how to uh, determine their uh, conditions of parole. And what we end up seeing is that these machine learning algorithms oftentimes propagate the biases that we would see uh, when humans try to make these decisions. There's a great article that recently came out of the MIT Technology Review, and the title says it all. Hundreds of AI tools have been built to catch COVID. None of them helped. So there's this huge gold rush of people who are very well-intentioned saying, we want to use machine learning to predict who's going to get COVID, to predict uh, what type of interventions to, to give to those people. And none of these tools helps. And it's because the blind application of technology is precisely that. It's blind. And we really have to think about um, the sort of socio-technical context in which we apply uh, machine learning. So those are some problems involving technology with respect to security and machine learning. You may have also heard uh, that Facebook just has problems with everything. Uh, so the, the whistleblower testimony has been um, quite amazing in explaining the uh, extent to which Facebook is misapplying a wide variety of technologies in ways that are harming society. So given all of this, uh, what we think is that there is a crisis in the way that we teach computer science. We as educators need to be approaching this idea of computer science pedagogy um, in an entirely uh, different way so that computer scientists can start to think more about the larger implications of the things that they build. And so what embedded ethics is gonna do is that embedded ethics is gonna revamp the standard approach to technical education. So how are we gonna revamp it? Well, here's our goal. Our goal is to have basically in each technical course that a student takes, ethical reasoning should be treated as a fundamental engineering skill, just as fundamental as the act of learning how to program, just as fundamental as um, understanding how to mathematically model things. We think that in each technical course, we also want to present uh, ethical components. So how are we going to do this? Well, practically, what we have to do is we, as computer scientists, have to engage in a partnership um, with folks from philosophy, because these folks from philosophy, they've been studying 
um, these 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 quandaries, uh, the, these dilemmas of of what happens when you have um, new technological developments being introduced into society. Um, the philosophy folks have a lot of experience in thinking about these types of things. So a uh, key principle of embedded ethics is that we have this partnership between the technologists on one side and the philosophers on the other side. So for a quick overview of, of how we've structured embedded ethics at Harvard, and we'll go into more detail on this with um, the stuff that Tristan and Jeff will tell us, but at a high level, here's what it looks like. So um, we have some faculty leads for the embedded ethics program. Uh, on the left, we have some folks um, from philosophy. Jeff is here as well as uh, Allison. They're both in the philosophy department. On the right, we have the uh, computer science leads, myself, uh, Steve, Barbara, uh, and Salil. So they kind of act as the, um, the high level uh, sort of steering committee. Uh, we make uh, important decisions about the direction of the program, but you know, it's not just us. Um, we need people to also help us think about the pedagogy because really that's, that's what we're in this business for. We want to change the pedagogy of uh, computer science in particular, and hopefully as we expand um, engineering, uh, business, entrepreneurship, uh, even medical training. So anyway, so right now we're mostly focused on computer science and we have some uh, great postdocs who help us to uh, design the lectures that we embed in each one of these computer science courses and also to carry out the actual teaching of um, these uh, ethics lectures. And uh, Jeff and Tristan will get into more detail later on today about how exactly we deliver um, the pedagogical content. But suffice it to say, we've got some postdocs here. On the left, we see our postdocs in philosophy. We also see on the right, our postdocs in computer science. Um, we've got Tristan, who's here, who's the bridge postdoc. He helps to um, try to integrate you know, perspectives from uh, different fields that might cross you know, both computer science and uh, philosophy, maybe with uh, business school folks, things like that. So he's a really critical part of the team. He'll discuss his role in more detail in a bit. Uh, we also have some grad fellows on the uh, philosophy side who once again help us to um, sort of craft the, the pedagogical strategies and deliver um, the actual embedded ethics lectures in each of these computer science classes. So that's sort of a, a, a 30,000 foot view of our organization. Um, and, and what do we want to do with this organization? Well. One of our primary goals is that we want to design course specific lectures about technical ethics. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that when we look at the content in these embedded ethics lectures, this content should feel like a natural extension of the quote unquote pure computer science material in a course. So the idea is that when students take one of these embedded ethics lectures, they shouldn't get the feeling that, oh, this was just some ethics content that was bolted on to this otherwise highly technical class. Instead, we want to look at um, ethical issues that are uh, particularly relevant to the particular course that the student is taking. So how do we do this? How do we make the content feel natural? Well, in each course, the content's going to be shaped by inputs from um, the CS professor who's teaching the class and also from uh, grad students and postdocs in philosophy who will help integrate um, sort of the, the philosophical side of things. And these topics that we discuss in the ethics lectures, well, they're integrated into a class assignment as well. So for example, after the ethics lecture, uh, computer science students might be asked to reflect on the lecture via uh, a midterm question, via part of a, a programming assignment that they have, via um, the writing of a reflection essay. And this follow-up is also very important too, because once again, we don't want the students to get the impression that we just sort of bolted on um, this ethics content. We want the students to come away with this idea that uh, ethics is an integral part of their technical education. So um, my, my, look at this wall of text. So here's just a, a sample of some of the, um, the modules, some of the embedded ethics lectures that we delivered in the 2020, 2021 academic year. Um, so in the very left-hand column, you see the uh, class name, and then you see the course title, and then you see the, the title of the ethics module that we delivered. So for example, um, in CS51, this is an early sequence course um, that most of our um, computer science undergraduates take. Um, we had an embedded ethics lecture called Moral Responsibility and Social Networks. 
So we uh, looked in particular at um, sort of how is um, Facebook how should it be held responsible for um, the behaviors of individual users on the platform? We looked at um, the role of Facebook's oversight board and whether the existence of that uh, oversight board has an impact on how we should judge um, the, the rest of Facebook with respect to, let's say, you know, the senior VPs or even Zuckerberg um, himself. So that's a very relevant lecture, obviously, but we have a bunch of uh, lectures in other classes as well. So for example, uh, CS171, that's a course on data visualization. In other words, how do we present complex uh, uh, data sets uh, to, uh, to people in a way that makes those data sets understandable? So in this particular module, uh, one of the things that we uh, looked at was we looked at the extent to which um, leveraging uh, sort of stereotypes and preconceptions in visualization can be harmful or hurtful. So for example, in visualization, one of the things that you're oftentimes taught is you want to reduce the cognitive burden of the person who's looking at your visualization. You wanna make it as easy as possible for them to visually parse information. Well, as it turns out, one way that you can reduce that burden is by leaning on potentially problematic uh, stereotypes. So, for example, using the color blue to uh, color code male and using the color pink to color code um, female. And so we looked at how there's this tension between um, reducing cognitive burdens and using um, preconceived notions of visualization that may actually perpetuate um, harmful assumptions. Just as a final quick example, um, here we see at the bottom a uh, CS263. That's a graduate level security class. It's all about how attackers break into our systems and how we can prevent those attacks from happening. And so in this class, we uh, had a module called the ethics of hacking back. The basic idea is, let's say that you're a company and uh, uh, cyber criminals have broken into your company, have stolen assets, they've taken HR files or something like that. Is it ethical for you as the company to do some vigilante justice and to try to steal your files back or to try to um, disable the attacker's network or something like this? It's actually not straightforward, right? Legally, whether this is something that's possible and also morally. You know, what are the stakes when, um, for example, the government says that they don't have the technical resources, for instance, to perform the hack back? In that case, should you, in essence, deputize yourself to do that? What, what's the morality of that? What's the risk of you improperly um, attributing the attack to someone who didn't really do it? What's the risk of escalation? So on and so forth. So that's just a, a quick overview of three of the modules um, that we did in the um, last academic year. And for now, I just want to note that ethics in CS is more than just ethics in machine learning. Uh, there's sort of this common misperception that really we only care about tech ethics when it comes to AI and ML, and that's just not true. Most of the classes that you see in this table, these are not machine learning classes, and yet we still find that they're very important and relevant uh, ethical uh, topics we can discuss. So what's the current status of embedded ethics? Well, uh, in the last academic year, we taught 25 modules, we delivered 25 uh, separate uh, embedded ethics lectures uh, at Harvard. Uh, since the inception of the program, we've taught 57 modules that span 39 different courses, and we've already had the opportunity to impact hundreds of undergrad learners. Um, and importantly, we think that the teaching lab, of which you'll hear about in more detail in a second, um, has trained a cohort of future leaders in tech ethics. Uh, so far, we've had 13 graduate fellows, uh, six philosophy postdocs, and four computer science postdocs. Uh, and what's happened to these folks after they've graduated? Huzzah, there's a slide right here that answers that question. I'm not going to go into detail here. We can all read. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say, we've had some great placements for the folks who've worked with us in the teaching lab. We've had people go on to a variety of tenure track uh, and teaching track positions at a variety of universities. We've had people go into um, some pretty prestigious uh, postdocs um, and uh, other sort of uh, of our graduates have gone on to uh, important positions in industry as well. And that's important, right? Because there's a lot of um, important technical work that's being done in industry, uh, not in academia. And even in industry, we need to have folks who are trained 
uh, to understand these issues that arise at the intersection of tech and ethics. And so you'll hear a little bit more about this, I believe, in Tristan's presentation, but I'll just give you a brief preview. I just want to say the embedded ethics approach, uh, it's spreading. So it started at Harvard. Now we've got um, some folks at Stanford, uh, at MIT, and over at Technion University in Israel who are starting to um, adopt uh, the embedded ethics approach, and in some cases are actual modules. And this is just continuing to happen in other universities as well. Um, so we're really excited that Harvard's been able to uh, demonstrate some thought leadership here, and we're uh, really excited about um, what comes next. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, hand the baton over to Jeff, who's going to talk a little bit more about the teaching lab. Thanks very much, James. Uh, so uh, as James says, I'm indeed going to spend some time now talking about uh, the teaching lab, which James has made reference to uh, at various points throughout throughout his presentation. Uh, and then when the time comes, I'll, I'll hand things over to Tristan, who will talk at sort of an even more fine-grained level about uh, uh, module development, what happens in the classroom when modules are being run. So I think to get a handle on what the ped oh, excuse me what the what the teaching lab is uh, and the, and the role it plays in the program, it's worth um, for a moment going back in time to the to the inception of the of the program in uh, in, in 2017. So when Barbara Gross and Allison Simmons. Uh, came up with the idea for this. Um, the 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 state of play was that um, computer science uh, faculty leads just opted into this. Um, Barbara and Allison found graduate students who were willing to try a new kind of uh, a new kind of teaching uh, to work with the computer science uh, faculty who had volunteered to run our earliest pilot modules. This is relatively small scale. We're talking about three or four in, in a term. Um, and it really took a lot of um, kind of pedagogical bravery, uh, but also innovation on, on the part of both the, the CS faculty members and the, and the graduate students who, who were doing the teaching. Um, and so in the earliest days, you know, the, the grad students were, were kind of doing as best they could, um, trying, to, trying to figure things out um, uh, as they went. As the program evolved over the next year or so, um, we were fortunate to have one of those graduate students become the inaugural philosophy postdoc uh, in embedded ethics. Uh, and he was tasked with, you know, sort of shepherding new graduate students uh, along the path that, that he had blazed. Um, and then, you know, unsurprisingly over time as, as the program grew, um, two things happened. One, um, there was uh, a felt need or, and, and a genuine need uh, for some kind of oversight and management of the, of the teaching team, the pedagogical core uh, 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 carrying out the work. Um, uh, and, and also uh, just a recognition that this kind of endeavor is extremely hard. Um, so pedagogically, we're asking uh, uh, the, the teachers involved to do something that's quite unlike um, what they're, you know, what, what they're used to doing. It's not a traditional TA assignment. It's not running your own course. Um, it's uh, this distributed pedagogical method um, that is supposed to both equip students, equip students with ethics-related skills over time, and also meaningfully integrate uh, whatever content that they're, they're discussing with the standing content in the computer science curriculum. And that's an extremely challenging task. So you can think of the teaching lab as our, um, our, our you know, attempt to solve uh, those problems. So the, the teaching lab is the pedagogical core that buttresses and supports uh, the graduate fellows and the postdocs who are, who are doing the on, on the ground teaching. So in academic year uh, 2019, 2020, um, I assumed the, this position I now occupy as 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 the faculty lead um, of of the teaching lab. Um, uh, so the role that I play um, is to provide you know some institutional memory. We have graduate fellows and postdoctoral postdoctoral fellows coming and going. So we wanted someone kind of on the on the core teaching team to um, to have kind of a broader view. Um, 
to provide, uh, you know, some direction toward developing modules so that they align with the program's overall pedagogical goals of enabling students to identify, reason about, and communicate about ethical challenges given rise to by computing technology. Um, and then, you know, to just simply help the, the postdoctoral fellows, um, you know, manage, manage the, the, the personnel involved. Um, so I'll say a little bit um, more about uh, the distinct roles that the, that the uh, kinds of people involved in the, in the teaching lab play, um, and then say a little bit about um, what, what we all do um, uh, collaboratively, what we all do together and, and how we do it. Um, so working now, I, you know, from like from the bottom, from the bottom up, um, uh, the graduate fellows are um, in my mind, sort of the, the, the key members uh, of the teaching lab. So as the, as the programs matured, we've now settled on something of a steady state in which our graduate fellows work with uh, three computer science courses per term. So uh, in, the, uh, in the, current, uh, the current semester, we have, we have three grad fellows, one of the four who's pictured will join us in the spring. We have three graduate fellows, each of those are, are paired with three courses, so that's nine. Uh, and, two, and then our two, two of our philosophy postdocs, I should say, are also running modules, which brings us to 11. We're running 11 modules this term. Um, so the graduate fellows are executing the bulk of the, of the on the ground uh, pedagogical work. They're meeting with course heads, settling on, uh, on topics and themes to discuss, developing the module, um, over the course of the term, executing the module themselves, and then preparing it for uh, open access sharing on our on our online repository. Tristan's going to walk you through some details of uh, of that process that that I'm not going to linger on. Um, the philosophy postdocs um, are kind of my lieutenants in some ways, in uh, you know, kind of helping to, uh, to to advance the pedagogical mission in the way that I just described. Um, they are at times uh, pedagogical mentors, at times they are research mentors, um, at, term, at times they are, um, you know, helpful bridges between uh, graduate students and faculty. Sometimes that, that, that uh, gulf is quite intimidating for one end <laughs> of, that, uh, uh, of, of that pair. Um, and then really crucially, uh, I want to linger here for, for a second on the role that our computer science postdocs play um, now in the form of uh, Shavorna and, and, and Arpita. So, um, you know, one of the one of the challenges I mentioned earlier about the about the pedagogical model is that we have to figure out how to advance uh, this you know this sort of skills based learning that we're interested in, while at the same time making the content that enables that learning meaningfully integrated with what is already happening in the computer science curriculum. Um, and I am in a terrible position to uh, make decisions of that kind myself. I'm a philosopher. Um, I, didn't, I don't approach this task with any kind of specialized training in, in computer science. I've co-taught with Barbara, but, um, but that exhausts uh, my, my sort of content expertise. Um, and so we decided that it would be uh, extremely valuable to have a couple of folks with us in the room uh, while we're um, developing content um, in, in real time to make sure that, uh, you know, we're not misstepping, that we're not missing opportunities to integrate the ethical and, and, and technical materials as closely as we can. So, you know, the way this all, um, you know, the way it happens, you know, what, is it, what, is it, what does in the room mean? Um, so every week the teaching lab meets for uh, two and a half hours, uh, and it is in large part a kind of pedagogical um, workshopping group. So while each of the graduate fellows, and in some cases the philosophy postdocs, um, you know, have primary responsibility for some courses content, we really think of it, uh, um, we really think of the, of the development uh, of, the, of the modules as a, as a, as a team effort. Um, so it's, it's too much to ask of any one person that they, that they, uh, carry, carry out this kind of work. And so, uh, we do it together in, in uh, 
in real time. Tristan's, I'm not gonna linger on that too long because Tristan I think is gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the nuts and bolts about, um, about, uh, about how that gets executed. I will tell one, one anecdote um, that I think is, uh, is a nice illustration of the kind, the kind of good that can be realized um, uh, by assembling this kind of team for a teaching purpose. So in the very first academic year that we had uh, CS postdocs integrated, this was 2019, 2020. Um, in fact, in fact, this was Shaborno was, has been with the program for, for several years. Um, I was chatting with um, one of our graduate fellows who was assigned to uh, a data systems class. And we had decided that the module would focus on privacy. Uh, so we got together with Shaborna, uh, who has you know, deeper knowledge um, than I could even you know, begin to understand uh, about, uh, about how data is stored and accessed. And uh, the three of us, that is me, the philosophy graduate fellow, and Shaborna were talking about uh, how the privacy themes that we were interested in might be integrated. And Shaborna was very excited and began talking um, about how the students were learning about column storage. And this was a great opportunity because column storage, XYZ column storage, ABC column storage. Um, and after like the sixth time that column storage was said, I was glancing nervously uh, with, with the philosophy uh, graduate fellow. And then finally kind of, you know, had to look for a polite way to interject and just say, uh, you know, what the heck is column storage? Um, and, you know, in a conversational moment that then required that we take even several, you know, several more steps back as Shabur and I started to, to, to explain, we learned from her, um, you know, that in designing uh, a database, uh, you have choices to make about whether uh, uh, the database will be optimized for editing, for retrieval, for deletion. So there are technical choices that can be made about um, how easy it'll be to, to, uh, to manipulate data in various ways. And it turns out that this has surprisingly direct implications for at least some matters, some ethical concerns with, with users' um, uh, uh, control over their, their private information. Um, and so this is you know, exactly the kind of thing we were hoping for, where we had this moment of confusion and needing to break down um, disciplinary divides. Um, but, but it uh, gave rise to this, um, this opportunity to develop the module so that it made meaningful contact with things that students were already doing in the course. And indeed, that's, that's exactly what happened in, in this instance. Um, I think at this point, the most helpful thing for me to do is to just turn things over to Tristan so that he can talk a little bit more uh, about, about the nuts and bolts. And I think that means no more screen sharing from James and some screen sharing from Tristan. Take it away. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, so what I'm going to talk about is um, as the person in the room who has gone through the process of developing and delivering a module, I'm going to talk about sort of the fine grained aspects of how we develop one and uh, what it's like to workshop this through the teaching lab. Uh, so we've talked about modules and lectures and different uh, these different kinds of uh, ways of delivering the content, but we have a as the pro as the program has gone on, it's uh, kind of started to converge towards uh, what is sort of like a standard format. So all of our modules have, as James mentioned, some ethical or social problem that we want to focus on in the module. And in order to discuss that and to give the computer science students the necessary background for learning how to think about the problem, learning how to reason about their own answers to it, rather than just being told this is the right answer, uh, we give them some philosophical concepts or theories that they likely won't have heard before elsewhere in their uh, education. We also make sure that there's a, a close tie-in with the technical material of the course. Uh, to, to help integrate it in the way that James explained, where uh, we really want the ethical reasoning and the philosophical toolkit to be seen as essential parts of the engineering skill set that we're trying to inculcate. Most modules also have some pre-reading 
And depending on the level of the course or the disposition of the instructor and other factors, this could take a number of different forms. They have been things like articles from Wired magazine or philosophical articles, either historical or recent. And sometimes they are technical uh, papers from computer science conferences where these issues are live topics of debate. Most modules also have some kind of follow-up assessment, as James mentioned. It could take a number of different forms depending on the structure of the course head's syllabus and what's most useful to the type of topic we're talking about. We develop, as, James, as uh, Jeff said, we develop these modules in the teaching lab. Uh, this is a recent photo. Despite the ongoing unpleasantness, we are continuing to meet in person. Uh, and sometimes, as you'll see, there's even cake. Uh, which was consumed, I am assured, uh, in one of the lovely outdoor spaces at the in the social engineering complex down in Alston. The work of developing this kind of module, as Jeff said, is highly interdisciplinary. It requires people uh, who understand the issues at a deeper level uh, on both sides of the disciplinary divide, which is why it's important to have all the different perspectives included there. And we have a kind of standard process whereby these modules come to be. Uh, first, uh, the lab members will start brainstorming potential topics after the uh, uh, person who's going to be teaching it, whether it's a grad fellow or a postdoc, has met with the course head to kind of set some ground rules. After the brainstorming, the module instructor goes away and thinks about it, goes and does some reading, comes up with a lesson plan that has some of the key points that they want to run through. And then we workshop this in the teaching lab to uh, kind of hammer out the dents and tighten up the pedagogical design. During this, uh, and then we have a second workshopping session with a much more full draft of the uh, module and any activities and slides and things like that. During these discussions, the philosophers are mainly offering pedagogical feedback, sometimes suggesting other topics to explore, or ways in which sensitive issues could be approached delicately. And the CS members, as Jeff mentioned, are here uh, to help with that, but also with technical tie-in and knowledge translation, where uh, uh, that we can do a kind of check to see to someone who doesn't have the background that these philosophers have, uh, is the content coming across in a way that's understandable? Uh, do we understand the technical content sufficiently such that uh, the module content is making sense and ties in well with the subject of the course? And are we using bits of jargon that are that have the that have different meanings across the disciplinary divide? Words like ontology, which for philosophers is about what exists and what's it like and in computer science and engineering is about these formal systems of categories and their logical relationships. Uh, during this process, the CS course head could be involved to a greater or lesser degree. Some get very deeply involved in our uh, uh, close co-creators of the module content. Others are much more hands-off and just kind of advise and help to, with the logistical details. For the most part, instructors are somewhere in between uh, and it depends on you know, how available they are and uh, how much work needs to go, how much extra work needs to go into tying it in with the course material. A little bit about our pedagogical approach. We strongly believe in active learning. Uh, we try not to have any of these modules be just a straight 75 minute lecture that will put the students to sleep and give them the impression that this really is just bolted on. So we really try to make sure to use lots of different active learning methods. Uh, some of them that we've used, which you might be familiar with, uh, we do things like think, pair, share, where we will ask the class an ethical question. Maybe it's about, um, uh, how comfortable you feel about sharing your data with, I suppose we should say meta now, uh, in order to access Facebook for free. Uh, and then they can pause, think about it, share it with a partner, and then we have a large group discussion. And that always brings out lots of different perspectives on these issues and helps to show this is not as simple as the professor is going to tell you the right answer. Uh, a slightly more in-depth version of this is to do it with small group discussion of a detailed case study where these ethical questions come up, and then we can have the small groups share their reflections with the whole 
class. We also use things like classroom response tools. This is a screenshot of one I used in the module I taught this semester. Uh, and you can see the students have contributed lots of great responses to the questions I was asking them. The farthest right column, some of them are injecting a little bit of humor and levity as well, so that's always great. We also sometimes have really ambitious activities. There was one this semester where the graduate fellow worked with the course head and the course's team of CS teaching fellows who were already on, uh, on staff for the course to build a, a really complex interactive to demonstrate some of the concepts that are being talked about in the module. So the course was about systems design and the specific topic was about uh, how can you design systems for rational choice ordering? So the case was uh, uh, choose your first, second, third choice for which school to send your child to. And if you design the system in a certain kind of way, it can be gamed such that uh, you make sure that your children always get the better schools. And depending on different demographic backgrounds and levels of education, uh, some groups of people find it easier to game the system than others. But if you design the system in a different way, it makes it so that those possibilities for gaming the system just don't come up. And so uh, they built this interactive that helps the students take on this role of a parent choosing which schools they'd like to send their children to. And they can see in real time how their technical work has an impact on this social and ethical question. Uh, active learning is important, not just because it's better pedagogy, but because it helps the students to start applying what they've learned right away in the context of their ordinary class. And this also connects with an approach that is called spaced practice. There's a lot of good re research to show that when you expose students to the same material in different modalities over time, it helps with retention and it helps them build these skills. And so that's why we've got these pre-readings, these follow-up assignments, and these active uh, activities in the classroom. Uh, just as a quick example, uh, this is me teaching a module in CS153 this semester. The course topic is this really technical esoteric specialization uh, called compilers. They're a kind of software that takes the code that humans write and can understand and turns it into the ones and zeros your computer actually runs. And it's a challenge to think of uh, ethical problems that can come up in this kind of situation. Uh, fortunately, we could we had some great work from a previous instructor to build on on open source software, which is software released under a special license that lets you copy, modify, and distribute it. And these uh, freedoms for what you can do with the software raise questions about, well, do those freedoms come with responsibilities? Like the freedoms that are protected by the state, we might think, come with responsibilities to contribute back to society somehow. Well, do you have a responsibility to contribute back to these volunteer run projects that make really important bits of software, such as compilers? And so this was the question we discussed. I didn't present it as having any one right option. We went through several different ways in which these responsibilities could be discharged. And the active learning bit was we had a discussion of a case study where uh, I gave them a scenario that pitted the profit motivation of a medical technology company against the good of contributing to an open source software project. And the discussion in large part focused on like, if your boss is telling you to do this one thing that helps your company and you feel like you, you ought to be doing this other thing that would be ethically good, how do you adjudicate that? How do you present your case to your boss so that you can uh, move your corporation in the right sort of direction. The follow-up assignment was a short blog post style thing, only about 200, 300 words, uh, asking them to reflect on whether there should be taxes to uh, support open source software development or whether the purpose of software, whether it's for healthcare or for some other purpose, influences how uh, easy it should be to share and modify rather than being locked up behind intellectual property law. So once we've done all of that, once we've developed the module, we've delivered it, we've collected some feedback from the students, uh, we do a write-up. 
and it goes into our public repository that lives on the Embedded Ethics website. These entries are all licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution License, which means it's very permissive. Anyone can take these and remix them uh, for their own context, so long as they attribute the author. These are tagged for ease of searching. There's different ways in which you can browse through them, depending on what you're interested in. Each entry has a number of different standardized elements. They all include a description of the course and the module and how uh, the course content and the module topic connect to one another. They include lists of learning goals and philosophical questions that the module wants to explore, as well as a list of key philosophical concepts and CS concepts and readings that could be a part of delivering a similar module, There's, as well as an agenda and sample activities and assignments. The aim here is not really to have these be ready-made lesson plans anyone could pick up and use without modification. They're really more to serve as documentation and to inspire others to develop their own materials that work best in their own teaching context. Uh, module uh, repository entries also contain uh, ample marginalia which include things like acknowledgments and reflections and uh, ex uh, explanations of pedagogical decisions that were made. As for the future of embedded ethics, uh, the program is continuing to grow despite uh, the weirdness of the last couple of years. It's continued to grow and we, continue, we have now about 12 modules every semester sometimes a little up and down. We've got ongoing collaborations with different institutions, many of them research institutions, but also NGOs like the Mozilla Foundation, uh, which has a large responsible computing project uh, that's trying to uh, bring people together in a network across uh, different institutions that are teaching uh, ethics for computing. We're increasingly also working with other kinds of institutions that are non-traditional in this area, but have a strong interest in developing these kinds of curricula, uh, including high schools, liberal arts colleges, community colleges, and even uh, executive education, education for working professionals. We're also, as uh, James, I think, mentioned uh, in early stages of talking about expanding outward into other areas of applied ethics. Uh, we're in early talks with the business school and the medical school about doing this. And just generally, if you're interested in what we're doing and if you think that uh, we could have something to chat about, uh, then please do reach out. Uh, you can send a message to embeddedethics at g.harvard.edu and we can start that conversation. Thanks very much. Uh, these are some links to follow up later. You can reach us directly or contact the program, as well as browse our website for more information. We look forward to your questions. Very good. Well, thank you so much. And we do have time for a few questions. Let's start with one. There's no monopoly on thinking about ethics in philosophy alone. It's one points out, you know, sociology, anthropology, gender race studies, etc. So why the collaboration between CS and philosophy? How do we start there? Maybe James, I can start with you. So I think that, um, you know, fundamentally speaking, the it's correct. You're, you're right that there are a bunch of different disciplines that can sort of comment on issues involving socio-technical challenges, right? I mean, at a high level, that's what we're looking at. I think that there, there's sort of like a pragmatic answer as to why we went to philosophy first. We had to start somewhere. And also it's... You know, it can be tricky going to technical programs and saying, hey, can we borrow a lecture of yours to, you know, talk about something that at first glance may not seem, you know, directly technical. And I think we sort of needed sort of a, for lack of a better term, sort of like a concise pitch. And that just helps us practically to sort of get a foothold to sort of talk about some of these issues. So I think that, you know, sort of organizationally speaking, it was easier for us to say, let's start somewhere. Let's do a collaboration with the philosophy folks um, and not have to draw on other schools. And now, you know, all of a sudden the meetings are like, you know, 5X is big, so on and so forth. So there's sort of a practical aspect to it. But I will say that, like, if we look at the bigger picture, it's exactly correct that, you know, a lot of these issues are 
cross disciplinary, not just like CS and philosophy, but CS and you know poli sci, CS and gender studies, things like that. And I think that sort of you know one of our sort of longer term sort of goals is to understand and to sort of better reflect some of those um, complexities there. Very good. Well, I'll, the next question I'm going to turn it on its head and turn it to Jeff first, which is based on your own experience, but that of what you're seeing the students. Does a philosopher need a deep technical background for CS people to take him seriously? Um, I don't think that a philosopher needs a deep technical background for um, for the students to take them seriously. I hope that's the case. Otherwise, I was not taken seriously uh, <laughs> while, while teaching uh, uh, in, the, in the CS department. I think that, um, uh, you know, what's needed is... Um, enough technical enough technical knowledge to be able to sort of probe um, the the interesting points in the in the normative or ethical landscape right so for example in that you know anecdote that I like about column storage um, what's needed there is enough technical knowledge to sort of see that ah you know um, this philosophical tool about um, you know understanding the import of privacy in terms of enabling users to exercise power over how their information is disseminated for example um, like the application of that idea to this context um, has implications for whether you know you want to optimize say for retrieval or, or deletion and you just you can't notice that um, unless you know you know enough now um, you know, do I know how to implement, um, uh, you know, a database um, to optimize for one of those things that, rather than the other? No, I mean, not, you know, not even, not even approaching that. Um, you know, so, so I think that, um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is prepare the graduate fellows and the postdocs to have enough technical understanding uh, to identify these, these key points in, in the terrain. Um, it would be great, I suppose, if we had a small army of people with full expertise in, in, in both domains, um, but uh, I'm confident we can, make, we can make some teaching progress um, without that utopic vision. Excellent. Well, this then leads us, and turn this next one to Tristan first. Thinking about the modules you've developed, and it's clearly there's an enormous amount of preparation that goes into these, a lot of careful work by a lot of people, particularly thinking about integrating them. And then you put them up on the web for anybody to use. So how, let's think about this a couple of ways. How do you avoid the bolt-on problem when it's not being used in a Harvard course? And what would you recommend to folks who, like Jeff, may be working in, in schools, perhaps even in corporations, they're coming out of HR and being asked to speak to programmers, et cetera. Like how, how do you bring Harvard's expertise to bear in other kinds of situations if you haven't had the privilege to be part of the ethics program? That's a great question and one that we're we're thinking about in terms of how to present these the, the repository to others uh, and how it can be made into uh, the most useful resource it could be. Um, I think it's uh, when taking one of the repository entries and uh, thinking about how to use it or adapt it into another context, uh, I think it's really important for whoever's doing that work to uh, think first about what is their own context, uh, to reflect carefully on um, what are the issues that we're facing, do they line up with the things that we find in this repository, um, and if they do find some alignment, to look at uh, not just the content uh, that's laid out in the main content of the, of the repository entry that explains like the different activities and pedagogical content, but also to look at those marginal notes where we explain, um, this is why we made this decision in this context. So we chose, it, it might be something like, for this course, we chose to have the students read a technical article out of a CS conference because it's a graduate level course and this is the kind of stuff they should be reading and writing at this point. Whereas if you're interested in the same topic, but you're uh, say at a startup that is uh, not so concerned with the theoretical s solutions to these problems and more, how, where do I get a tool to help me develop 
uh, a solution to the problem that we're facing, uh, you'd have to look at that and understand the differences in context and uh, start looking for uh, other tools that align with what you can get out of the module. So my general advice to someone in that position would be use our mod use our repository as a resource but not as a not not as a playbook that you can just take off the shelf and run in your own context. Very good. I think we'll have time for one more question I want to direct to all three of you in whichever order you folks prefer. A nice question has been raised here but ethical frameworks tend to result in deeply personal reflections. Yet the issues that you're dealing with are often explicitly political, like free speech, and often require a collective response. So how do you, how do you think about that balance? Or how do you want your students to think about that balance between the deeply personal and the collective action when you're thinking about computer ethics? Jump ball. Uh, all right, I've jumped. Uh, so, so one thing that I think it's really important for, for engineering students to understand, and really for all students, um, is that you know decisions that one tries to make under an ostensibly apolitical sort of context, that never works. Like all these decisions are political, you know? And like, I think a lot of technologists in particular fall into this trap of saying, I just push bits around. You know, I just make algorithms. And so, you know, I'll let society sort of decide like what the implication of my algorithm is, but me, myself, I just build things, you know, and they say, oh, in the same sense that like a bridge is not political, my code is not political, but oh, but bridges can be political, <laughs> right? So it's like, how do you decide where to build the bridge? Did you have to displace people to build that bridge? Who is that traffic serving? What neighborhoods is it going to? And that's actually an example I use sometimes in class to say that, like, look, just because we're building things and we're just manipulating quote unquote numbers, those numbers actually correspond a lot of times to, you know, human outcomes. And so I think that that's sort of an important thing that, um, you know, we, we try to convey that, you know, as builders, the decision to even build or not build something. That can be, you know, an ethical decision and, you know, it can be an, a political decision too, because some people who also view themselves as ethical may not have built that thing that you decide to build or vice versa. So I think we can't, you know, as, as ethics uh, and, and tech sort of teachers get away from that fact. I think we have to embrace it and say, we should just think about what are the implications and just make sure that we're reasoning explicitly about this stuff. All right. So execution being responsible for execution doesn't mean you've absolved of all responsibility for ethics. Nice. Jeff, maybe take the question, same question to you. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I mean, first plus one to, to James's response. Um, I wanna underscore two other ideas. One uh, is that, um, you know, James, James actually briefly previewed this. We sometimes talk about the program as if it's sort of primarily for people who will become professionals in, you know, computer science and some traditional guys. So like, you know, we're, we're thinking about program, you know, product managers or, or, or engineers, but it's really meaningful to me that, you know, for our manifestation of this work, we're, th this is happening in a liberal arts college that teaches, um, you know, a diverse undergraduate population with, with broad interests. So some of the students, even some of the students who are majoring in computer science, um, are going to go on to law school. They're going to go on to work in not-for-profits. They're going to go on to work in government. Um, and so part of what we're doing, as I see it, is equipping people with a set of skills that can be deployed um, in a variety of decision-making contexts, some of which will be um, in contexts in which they're working in, you know, like explicitly political contexts. Some of them are going to be contexts that aren't explicitly political, but involve, you know, decision making, problem solving with huge groups, you know, for, for widely scoped problems. So we do hope, I hope anyway, um, that that some of the educational goods that we're that we're providing will will be useful um, in, in in sort of re reorienting toward toward these to these political questions, but. Um, I think that, you know, sort of despite the, the ways in which some of the challenges we're talking about really are obviously society level problems, um, it's a mistake, I think, not to focus at all on, I think, what you called in setting up the questions, you know, individual ethics. So in contexts in which the social issues aren't being solved um, by 
you know, our, our usual political decision-making mechanisms, then it affords individuals lots of leeway for, for, how, for how to act. You know, so you might think, look, how should autonomous vehicles act? That's a social political question that should be solved at that level. But in the meantime, it means that car manufacturers um, have a lot of you know, permissible um, options because they're, they haven't been constrained. And so we should help people figure out um, when they're in decision-making contexts like that, what the best way to proceed is given that the, you know, the social level decision-making isn't, isn't happening speedily enough. Very good. So you're seeing the responsibility on both sides again. Tristan, I'm going to turn to you sadly quickly, but I do want to give you the last word, be fair. Thoughts sure. on the subject? Yeah, so uh, the only, like, these beautiful answers, is the only thing I want to add to it is, um, uh, I think what one of the goals of the program is to hit both sides of this, where we want both to uh, inculcate a sense of ethical responsibility and in individual technologists, and individual savvy computer users, uh, and to give them the tools to take responsibility in the appropriate kinds of ways. But at the same time, in so doing, we're hoping to, to enact a culture shift within technology and within society, where people are thinking about these issues and can collaborate on collective action to solve some of these uh, pressing problems that come up in, con in conjunction with new technologies. Very good. Well, thank you, Tristan, Jeff, and James. And thanks to all of you who have joined us today. We'll hope you join us for more signature events soon. For example, next Wednesday, the 17th at 5 p.m., join Paul Farmer and Arthur Kleinman as we talk about connecting scholarship with action. Information on upcoming events, as well as recordings of this and our past signature events, can be found at vpal.harvard.edu slash vpal-events. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us.